Hi everyone. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Stanislav, game designer at Ubisoft. Thank you all for joining us at this conference and at this presentation in particular. I hope you'll enjoy it. I love making video games, as do all of you, which is why we're all here. And we live in exciting times for the medium. Well, all times are exciting, but we're now past the infancy stage when the pioneers have put video games on the map and have defined the basics and foundations that we still use to this day. We're past the more experimental childhood phase when we're combining mechanics together to see what works and what doesn't, and that's how different genres, conventions, disciplines, guidelines were born. And now we're in these sort of formative teenage years when we're trying to figure out what is our place in this world? What is our purpose, our future? Where do we stand in the overall human culture? And among other artistic mediums in particular, all in all, it can be boiled down to a typical teenage question, what makes us unique? Now, I'm sure everybody here is ready to jump and yell, interactivity, that's what makes us unique. Video games are active, everything else is passive. Well, yes, but what does that really mean? Especially considering that for the longest time, we were aspiring to be like other mediums, books and movies especially. The important question here is why we were doing so. Well, the reason is that we considered these mediums to be our closest relatives, books more in the early days, movies more in the later days, and as established mediums, they knew how to build deep emotional bonds between the artistic work and the person experiencing them, allowing the work to resonate and stay with them for a long time. I'm sure you all have like a movie or a book that, you know, has left something in you. And of course, video games wanted to do that as well, which is why they've, we've started learning as much as possible as we could from them, which is good because, you know, there are a lot of principles and guidelines that are applicable. Uh, however, we can't learn everything from them. There's one thing that we have to learn on our own, and that is how to truly harness the power of interactivity. Because interactivity, it's not just about feedback. It's not just about, oh, I press X on a controller and something happens on screen, a person jumps. Every medium has their unique strengths which they use to make those deep emotional connections and bonds with people. And interactivity is ours. And you know, people in game development usually get to this realization somehow on their own, but I think this should be um, widespread knowledge. Uh, not everybody should act on it, but everybody should know about it. And uh, other mediums deal with this kind of stuff by making guidelines. So for example, if you go to any school related to creative writing, movie making, or even actually game design, you will be taught this principle, show, don't tell, based on apocryphal quote by Anton Chekhov, which you can see on the screen. Uh, its point is that indirect communication is more efficient at making people empathize with what's happening on page or on screen than direct statements. Uh, for example, in the book, you wouldn't say John is shy. You would talk about his feelings. That name doesn't relate to you. It's just a random name. Um, in a movie, you wouldn't have a character say, oh, John, you're so shy. You would show him feeling insecure and riling himself up before approaching to talk to somebody. Now, of course, as any guideline, this is not a 100% do this all the time rule, but it provides this direction of what to do to make people care. All the best movies and books use this rule one way or another. And in video games, we have learned to apply it pretty well to cutscenes, dialogues, visual narrative, but it's not really applicable to gameplay that well. That's because there are fundamental differences between how we experience emotions in an active or a passive state. So in a passive state, uh, when we read a book or watch a movie, we experience emotions through empathy. You put yourself into another person's shoes to understand how they feel, what are their thoughts, what are they thinking about, this is how movies make us care, make us laugh, make us cry, you know, all that sort of stuff. But when you introduce agency, when you have video game mechanics that you interact with the input method, it's no longer about empathy because you are putting yourself on that side of the screen. So this becomes 
essentially a projection. That's, this is why we call like our characters avatars in the game and stuff like that. It's not just understanding how somebody feels. You don't just put yourself in another person's shoes. We need a guideline for that, for this particular emotional connection, which I cheekily call play don't show. Now, I don't know if this particular quote will ever catch on, but the point is that just like the show don't tell, indirect communication via the use of game mechanics and control inputs can be more efficient than a passive experience at creating emotions and feelings. And this screenshot here is from a game called Brothers, HLF Two Sons, which I'm gonna absolutely spoil it right now for you, but even if you haven't played it before, you still will need to play it after. So Brothers is, well, it's a story about two brothers who travel to the tree of life to find cure for their dying father. Now, the interesting thing about this game mechanically is that you control both brothers at the same time with a single controller. The left half corresponds to the older brother, Naya, and the right half to the younger brother, Nayi. Uh, both of them have unique interactions, but the main interaction mechanic in the game relates to swimming. The younger brother, Nayi, he is deathly afraid of water due to traumatizing events in the past. So to swim, he actually you have to hold the right trigger button, this is important, to hold on to the older brother as he swims. Um, and you go through the game, you know, learning to control both brothers efficiently at the same time, working as a team, going through all those obstacles and challenges on the way, until at one point in the game, the older brother gets mortally wounded and eventually dies. And as you control Nae when you try to desperately save him and then later bury him, you feel the loss not just because it has happened on screen, but because the way you interact with the game itself has changed. For the past two and a half hours, you've been using your both, your both thumbs, your both fingers to you know, try and control two brothers efficiently, and now you just, you just don't need one hand anymore. You can go through the rest of the game one-handed, and this provides this subtle feeling of loss that wouldn't be possible otherwise. But this is not the greatest thing about brothers. The greatest thing comes later, when <clears throat> Nae meets a last stretch of challenges before getting back home, and the first one of them is water, which he has to swim through. And older brother is dead, so he can't hold on to anybody, and he still refuses to go in because he's still afraid of water. And people usually get stuck at this moment for a little bit before they figure out what to do. And when they do figure out, something magical happens. And I'm going to show now a video of edited footage from a stream by Day9, you know, showing what kind of emotions happen when people figure out how to get past. Now, I hope the sound and video will work. I'm literally going to backtrack. Oh, wait, what? I just held L2, or the left button. If you didn't hear, that was the spiritual voice of Naya guiding the boy as you hold the older brother's interact button. And look at his emotions there. Oh my god. This, you, like, the controls are what are emotional right now. I'm using my dead brother's controls. I can't, but if I use his... And notice how he said, my dead brothers. That's projection at work there, when you, when you are this boy. Oh god, I need to start smoking. Ugh. I just want to like message my brother and be like, you didn't get up, you fucking asshole. And he's gonna be like, what? If <laughs> you didn't get up. I had to bury you. He's <laughs> what the? It was everything okay? Did something happen with mom? Is everything all right? I'm like just, oh. <laughs> what did you do today? I sat still, looking at a monitor, and pressed buttons in a sequence that made me cry. The moment when I held L like the brother's controls 
and do more. That is one of the strongest moments that could only ever exist in a game. And, you know, it would have been so easy to do with this with a cutscene or a scripted event. Just, you know, have the spirit of the older brother appear, say something inspirational to Nae, and now Nae can swim. And honestly, that would have been fine. But it wouldn't have been as powerful as, you know, what the game proposes now. And as a counterpoint to Brothers, I'm going to talk about Bioshock for a bit, which I'm also going to totally spoil, but come on, it's 10 years old now, you, sh you should know about it. Um, so, in Bioshock, there's a twist that everything that you do in the game is you actually being mind-controlled via the usage of the phrase, would you kindly? And you learn about this in a sequence of interaction with uh, when you get to the antagonist, one of the antagonists, Andrew Ryan, as you are kindly sent to kill him. And that moment when this all information is revealed culminates in this scene. A man chooses, a slave obeys. This is all looks pretty powerful, and it's set up in a very good way, but my problem with this particular scene is that we have a game, the whole point of which is to explore the notions of player agency, the futility of player choice, how our actions don't really matter, and in the most important scene of the game about player agency, they take agency away from us and just show it in a cutscene where you don't press a single button. Now, I've talked about this online with several people, and an argument that I hear is that, uh, you know, if you would add player interaction, things would be less cinematic, because players would try to do something else. But that's exactly what you want. Uh, why would a player heal would try to break the game and do something that and do something that will break the game because they don't want to feel like a slave. They wouldn't want to feel like they have to do what the game tells them to do until eventually, if they want to complete the game, they will have to succumb to the game wishes and press the hit button again and again and again and again until Andrew Ryan's is dead. Now, you know, as a cutscene, it shows the point, but it's not as powerful as it could have been with that added bit of interaction. And as it stands now in the game, this moment in the very beginning when you're kindly asked to pick up a crowbar or something is actually a better examination of this notion of futility player choice because technically you can ignore picking up this wrench. But if you don't, you won't be able to progress through the game, so you'll have to pick it up anyway. Um, but I'm not trying to say that cutscenes are bad. As anything, cutscenes are a tool. I love cutscenes, I love video games like Uncharted that, are, that have a lot of cutscenes, and one of my most favorite video games of all time is Telltale's The Walking Dead, which, if you boil it down, it's pretty much mostly cutscenes. But uh, The Walking Dead, it smartly adds those moments of interaction to give a powerful punch to its moments. And I'm not gonna spoil the whole game, but I will spoil one moment. At one point in the game, um, son of your uh, of your friend, his the son's name is Duck, uh, gets bitten by a zombie and is about to die. And well, you all know what needs to be done with people who are about to get transformed into zombies. You need to shoot them in the head. And there's a choice. 
if you allow Kenny, the father, to do it, or if you do it yourself as Lee, the main character. Now, most people actually pick to do it themselves, and what follows after is not a cutscene of Lee shooting the boy. You actually, like you would in an action sequence, have to target the gun, aim at the boy's head, and then press a button to shoot. And this, you know, it's, it's a five-second interaction, really, but it makes all the difference. Because if we would have this in a cutscene, we would feel sad because, you know, it's a sad moment and we would understand what they're going through. But when you add this interaction, you're dealing not with empathy, you're dealing with projection. It's not just Lee who is doing this hard thing. You actually have to point a gun at a child's head and shoot. And... Even though this is a video game, the thought is in your head now that you have to do it, and that can be very powerful. Some people actually can go through with this, and Telltale has a sequence when if you can't do it, then both just walk away. And I've talked right now a lot about you know, narrative-based games that you control with a controller, but really, this principle, it can apply to all genres and input methods from touch screens to peripherals to that wonderful monstrosity from Steel Battalion, uh, because it all boils down to a question that you need to ask yourself early in the development. What do you want to talk about? What are the topics that you want to examine? What are the themes that you want to explore? Now. I could talk right now a lot about stuff like how mechanics influence perception, how set of mechanics that create player stories can be just as powerful as pre-written narrative, how abstract mechanics can explore themes in a powerful way, but all of that would not matter if you don't have anything to say. If when playing the game, players don't have, don't have something to dig for to build that strong emotional bond. Um, and... You know, they don't have to interpret it the way you want them to because it's subjective, interpretation is subjective, but if there's nothing behind your mechanics and visuals, then they're not going to find anything. So what do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about trust, like Brothers, that examines trust in its main mechanics between the two brothers, as well as with strangers who help along the way, but also trust with strangers is what leads to older brother's death. Uh, do you want to talk about player agency like Bioshock, even though I've criticized Bioshock just a little bit before for the mo how it uh, made its main twist scene, uh, the game is cohesive enough and it resonated with people because there was something that the developers wanted to talk about. Do you want to talk about hope and redemption through Lee's relationship with Clementine? If you have a topic that you want to talk about, you will be able to build that emotional connection. The problem is that in games, we usually start with an idea, with an abstract concept of a mechanic that we then build around on and, you know, test and, you know, gameplay comes first. And a lot of times what happens is that we try to imbue meaning very late in development, which doesn't, doesn't work really. So ultimately, games can be fun, but pretty shallow. But if you start asking yourself, what is it that you want to talk about, whatever it is, and then start building holistically your game around it, mechanics, narrative, visual style, music, everything with that in mind, then in the end, you'll get a beautiful, immersive, resonating experience that will stay with people for a very long time. And this is it for my presentation. It's only one third of what I actually wanted to talk about, but you know, there's a 20 limits timer. So thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it and I'm ready for questions. Thanks, thanks for the speech, very interesting. I just wonder, uh, regarding the end of, of, uh, of your speech, when you talked about the story that it has to kind of come first, or at least that's something I've read from that. So I wonder, would you say that you would always start with the idea of the story to tell and therefore the mechanics? Or is it okay to start with the mechanics and layer the story at the top of it? Like, 
what would be the, the, the golden rule here? Is there any golden rule here at, the, at all? Well, uh, should I repeat the question? So the, uh, the question is, if there is a golden rule to what started with the story or mechanic. Uh, there is no golden rule, and actually, when I talk about themes, I don't necessarily mean story. Uh, so, you know, themes, exploring a theme doesn't have to include a narrative because you can explore a theme with, uh, just with the mechanics. But really, yeah, you can start with whatever you want. Uh, the most important part to consider is that when you start with mechanics, but if you just if you don't think about the theme of your mechanics early enough, like what do you want to actually build around, then you won't be able to put that in later. Uh, and I can. Does everybody know the? Well, I guess everybody knows the Lord of the Rings. Uh, so the Lord of the Rings as a book and as a movie, they have a lot of themes from hope, uh, unity, fellowship, uh, courage despite despair, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, the books uh, examining these themes, the movies examining these themes, but video games, you know, they can relate the plot, the spectacle, the world, but usually the Lord of the Rings-based video games don't really, you know, if you give them to somebody who doesn't know anything about the book, they won't really get it because it's mostly about fighting. Now, there is actually a game that is not a video game. That's um, It's a card game, the Lord of the Rings trading card game. And it actually, it actually examines the themes of the story very well. And I'm just going to talk about one example to not go on for too long. So, as you know, a trading card game, it's essentially mechanics and setting. There's no story to it. But if you take, for example, deck building from the Lord of the Rings trading card game, there's two components to it. Uh, the free people's part of the deck, the good guys, and the shadow part of the deck, the bad guys. Now, the free people, they have better synergy when it's multicultural, multiracial. There is a special sigil mechanic that makes sure that your decks are more powerful when you put in... Uh, cards from different factions, different races. Now, the shadow part, the evil part, it's there. It has better synergies when it's just one faction, when it focuses just like on one particular side, and that's an exploration of the theme. There's no story, there's no narrative, but when you when you build your deck and you understand that oh, good guys, more diversity; bad guys, less diversity. That's a thought that now gets into your head and what you think about, even subconsciously. Um, so, yeah, you don't necessarily have to start with a story, but you need to think about the theme early enough. I uh, hope that answered your question. So you showed the, the Tale of Two Brothers as yeah. an example of a success story of using this, uh, just for the sake of inspiring us and giving us uh, ideas for what, things that we can incorporate in our games. What's another one of your favorite ways that this has ever been implemented in things that you've seen? Okay. Um, one... Uh, so there are several examples to look at. Uh, one is uh, The Last Guardian. That's also, I'm not going to spoil The Last Guardian uh, because it's pretty new. Uh, but uh, what it does pretty well is this relationship with the um, beast, Trico. Um, you know, at the beginning of the game, when you press the button to call him, for example, he doesn't, he's not, respond, he's not responding that well. He's like, oh, he doesn't listen to you. But then as you progress, more through the game and your relationship gets better, you know, when you press button to call him, you're like, Trico, and like, he's like, he's right there, like, he, he, there's a bond in gameplay, and you can give commands to him, so in uh, The Last Guardian, the controls on the controller are, like, in a, set up in an interesting way that, you know, triangle is head, then it was like, the left offhand, the main hand, and legs, so this is how you control your uh, main character actions. And you can give commands to Trico with that as well. That you know, you you hold the Trico trigger and then press jump and you ask him to jump and uh, to some surface. And at first he doesn't really do that, he's unresponsive. And this actually brings frustration to a lot of players at the beginning because you know, one frequent thing that you'll see in the forums is like, oh, Trico doesn't listen to me. Well, of course he doesn't listen to you. He's, he's a beast that you need to build your relationship with. But then as you progress through the game, when you when you do give him this command, Trico jump there, he does that instantly, and that 
and you know that you feel how that connection builds up. Um, another very cool game. Well, Lord of the Rings trading card game. Obviously, I already, already mentioned it. It's, it's got a lot of you know the the way the journey is set up there and how you know it gets more dangerous along the way and how you have to how you actually have to sacrifice your uh, free people's uh, characters to go on it's it creates these player stories that are really in line with the Lord of the Rings narrative and themes and another if the very interesting example that I think people should look at is uh, Thomas was alone which um, I don't know if I can show it here, but it's it's essentially it's a game about rectangles. You know, it's rectangles that jump, but these are some of the most, you know, they have some of the most best character arcs you've seen in a video game. These rectangles, because uh, so they all have different jumping mechanics. Like for example, there's Christopher, who's like grumpy and like jealous of Thomas, and he's like a little square who jumps, who doesn't jump very far, but then through interaction with other squares, like he he goes through the, an arc that changes him, and you know, every square character does that. So that's an interesting example. And uh, What kind of games uh, did inspire you to become a designer? Maybe some people know about, so there was a game, an old Russian RPG, it's in the West known as Evil Islands, in Russian maybe it's uh, some people know about it, Prokrete Zemli. Uh, I played it as a child when I was nine years old, back in the year 2000, and you know, after that, it was like, I want to make video games, and I discovered Gamma Sutra and started learning more modding and scripting, and but it all came from that one game. The, you know, it had it had very interesting mechanics that some of them, like the crafting in Evil Islands, it's to this day it's pretty unique and not really done in games. So, and it had also very great narrative and great characters. Okay, well, um, if there's anything that you'd like to ask or talk about, there's my email on the screen. If if you'd like to listen me speak more, I have a YouTube channel where I talk about stuff. Feel free to visit that. And thank you all for being here. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. And I guess I will um, stand down. Thank you, Stas. That was amazing.